Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. He's the only astronaut without a military and aviation background to have set foot on the moon. He and other scientists entered the history books as the first time NASA sent scientists to accompany astronauts into space. But that's not the most curious fact about Harrison Schmidt. Not even close. You could say he studied and prepared his entire life for the moment when he stepped foot on Apollo 17 on December 11th of 1972. After studying geology at the California Institute of Technology, he spent a year at the University of Oslo. In 1964, he received his Ph.D. from Harvard. From rocks to gas and the matter that makes up planets and their moons, I think it's safe to say that Schmidt knew a lot about the material that makes up our world. While most geologists work for energy companies or mining sectors, Schmidt took a different route. In 1965, he found work creating geological field techniques at the U.S. Geological Survey's Astrological Center in Flagstaff, Arizona. Those techniques would go on to be used by Apollo crews. When NASA decided to send scientists to the moon with astronauts, they selected Schmidt. Schmidt trained with the Air Force for the next year, learning to become a jet pilot. Schmidt made his second mark in history as the only geologist in the astronaut corps. From there, He moved to Houston, where he put his lifelong love of geology to use, training the astronauts to become better at recognizing geologic changes while in orbit and collecting material from the moon's surface. In March of 1970, Schmidt was assigned to the Apollo 18 crew. Unfortunately, his hopes were dashed when NASA scrubbed the mission. All wasn't lost, though, and his breakthrough came in late August when scientists convinced NASA to reassign Schmidt to the Apollo 17 mission. It would be the last Apollo mission. Schmidt certainly had some shoes to fill, replacing astronaut Joe Engel as the lunar module pilot. Two years later, on December 7th of 1972, Schmidt and his crewmates, Commander Gene Cernan and Ronald E. Evans, boarded Apollo 11 at the Kennedy Space Center for launch. A few days later, Cernan and Schmidt landed on the moon. Before collecting rocks, Schmidt took pictures and claimed to have snapped the iconic blue marble photo of Earth. To date, it's the most widely circulated photo ever taken. Schmidt collected formations, picked a sample that became one of the most significant rock specimens ever collected. At just five ounces, the plutonic rock has helped NASA support its theory about what material makes up the moon's core. After collecting samples, Schmidt and Commander Cernan returned to the lunar module. Both men removed their helmets. Moments later, Schmidt realized that he was congested. Was it the start of a cold? With his next breath, the inside of his nose felt irritated. It was then that he understood the source. He and Cernan had moon dust on their suits, helmets, and boots. Schmidt felt his throat tighten. His voice faltered. It turned out that Schmidt was allergic to the very thing that he had trained for, the moon's surface. He wouldn't be the only one, though. One of the flight surgeons on the mission also suffered an instant and severe reaction. Both men recovered, though, and the mission resumed. Apollo 17 splashed down in the South Pacific Ocean on December 19th, of 1972. In the 50 years since the Apollo 17 mission, Schmidt has advocated testing future pilots against such allergic reactions. The soft, powdery material is difficult to remove, even when the astronauts attempt to brush it off. For Schmidt, the ease with which moon dust can make its way into astronauts' lungs, it seems, is nothing to sneeze at. The world is a massive place, with billions of people separated by thousands of miles of oceans. But every once in a while, something serendipitous takes place. We might run into an old friend in an unlikely location, or realize that the differences between our cultures aren't as vast as we had once thought. But Cornish missionary William Colenso discovered something quite unexpected on his trip to New Zealand in the late 1830s, that the world was a lot smaller than any of us really knew. Born in Penzance, Cornwall, England in 1811, 
Colenso was a printer's apprentice before he joined the Church Missionary Society to spread the gospel. It was 1834 when he first traveled to New Zealand and came face to face with the native Maori people and their customs. According to some reports, he was the first European to ever set foot within the village. They welcomed him in, allowing him to witness their customs. Colenso was watching some Maori women cook potatoes when he noticed something strange about the pot they were using. It was made of bronze. These people wouldn't have cooked in a bronze vessel. They would have used something wooden with heated stones inside to warm their food. Not to mention, Colenso was, if not the first, then among the first Europeans to enter their community. The Maori had never traded with foreigners before. So where had they gotten this bronze pot? Well, as he began to examine it more closely, he realized that it wasn't a pot at all. It measured six inches across by six and a half inches tall, with a jagged lip going around its opening. There was also an inscription embossed around its middle in a language Colenso didn't understand. But what he did know was that the object the Maori had thought was a pot was, in fact, actually the crown of a ship's bell. It had apparently been in their possession for decades and had been discovered tangled among the roots of a tree that had been felled during a storm. Colenso knew it needed to be studied further, and so he bartered with the women, offering them an actual cast-iron pot in exchange for the bell. They acquiesced and allowed the missionary to take it back to England. It was later revealed that the writing around its rim was Tamil, a language spoken in parts of India, Singapore, and Sri Lanka. But how had it wound up so far from home? In 1882, a New Zealand scientist named William Maskell suggested that it might have been owned by a sailor who had traveled to South Asia and taken it for his own before ultimately losing track of it later. Almost a century beyond that, historian Robert Gossett claimed that it had been part of a ghost ship that had lost its crew and traveled thousands of miles away from its home before crashing into New Zealand. Neither story, though, was ever confirmed. And then there was the matter of the inscription— at first, it was believed to date back as far as the 14th century, but that theory was dismissed as of several years ago. Nalina Gopal, a museum curator in Singapore, examined the bell in 2019. A native Tamil speaker herself, Gopal easily read the text along the bell's edge without question. That was because it was more modern than earlier researchers had determined. Gopal knew that an older version of Tamil would have been almost impossible to read because it would have been too different from the current iteration of the language. She figured it was only as old as the 17th or 18th century. As for what it said, the literal translation read, The Bell of the Ship of Mohideen Bucks. Early experts assumed that meant that the ship had been owned by a person with the name of Mohideen Bucks, but not Gopal. After quite a bit of research, she determined that Bucks wasn't the owner, nor was it the name of the ship. It was the name of a saint. In fact, many ships coming out of Southeast Asia at the time would have been named Mohideen Bucks as a way to bless them on their journeys to keep them safe. And, at least in this instance, it didn't work out so well. Not only did Gopal, nor any of the other experts who studied the bell, know how it arrived in New Zealand, there was no trace of the ship that had carried it either. And we might never know the true story behind the bell's provenance. The sea may get angry and loud at times, but there is no greater keeper of secrets on this earth than the water that covers it. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.